Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and I've got a question for you. What do you think they're doing with your DNA? Oh, you got that 23andMe kit for the holidays, and you just loved looking at your lineage. You've seen the commercials on television about your ancestry, but what if somebody was really interested in your DNA? You've sent it off to a total stranger, some company you don't know anything about. You don't know where that database is, what it's being used for, and who might have hacked it. Well, why does that really matter? It's not like you're sending out your social security number or your passwords or your credit card numbers or any kind of personal identification. Or maybe you are. Maybe your real identity as to who you are matters to someone and something, and that would be Satan himself. Why would he care about your DNA? Because there's a Y chromosome marker in your DNA that tells us whether or not you are in the line of Aaron. That's right, Aaron, the high priest of the Bible. Why does that matter to you? Why does that matter to Satan? Why does that matter to God? Because unless the Sanhedrin reforms and the high priest in the line of Aaron takes up his role as the head of the Sanhedrin and calls for Jesus' return, Jesus doesn't come back. Well, what if there was a way to weaponize that DNA and take out you in the line of Aaron turn that, that DNA into a virus that would attack only those that have that Y chromosome marker. You think it's far-fetched? Over 200 Russian scientists, genealogists, moved to Tehran in the fall of the Soviet Union to work on the weaponization of DNA. Satan wants to take out this line of the Jewish people with that marker and you might not even know that you're Jewish. You might not even know that you're in the line, but that DNA will tell, and Satan wants that and wants to know who you are, and that's the plot line of the best-selling book, The Codist, now out in second edition. We want everyone to read this book and hear this story, a biblical proportion, available right now, two ninety nine dollars on Kindle. And I want you to visit our webpage, ignitinganation.com, and scroll to the bottom of the page where we have special offers. Click on this yellow cover of the book called The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life. You click on that picture of the book cover, a window is going to come up. We're going to ask you for your email address. We won't send you spam because spam is not kosher, but we will give you the first chapter of this book for free and take you on a journey from the Garden of Eden, the tree of life that was so precious to God that we got kicked out of the garden and our lives now have an end, but yet we see that tree of life again right there at the river of life. What were the lessons that God was trying to show us? Those are revealed in the pages of this book. I want to welcome into the program Mark Cosgrove, author of The Brain, the Mind, and the Person Within, The Enduring Mystery of the Soul. Mark is a professor and chairman of the psychology department at Taylor University, and where he has taught the subject of foundations of Christian thought for more than 30 years. He's author of six volumes, including Counseling for Anger and the Essence of Human Nature. In the brain, the mind, and the person within, Professor of Psychology Mark Cosgrove not only explains what the brain is all about, but also corrects common misinterpretations and demonstrates that when we know about the what, uh, what we know about the brain coheres with the Bible. Mark Cosgrove, welcome to Revealing the Truth. Thank you, Mark. Good to be here. Uh, you. Um, have been studying the subject of the brain, the subject of the mind, will, emotions, what we would call the soul. What took you on that journey in your youth? What, what, was, what fascinated you and what was it like for you to embrace this path, which is so extraordinary for somebody with a biblical foundation to approach the brain? I suppose uh, teaching teaching with other faculty. I taught physiological psychology. Over the years, I've met many other scientists. Uh, I learned over time that our brains are not ordinary. Our brains are effectively the most complicated structure in the universe. And every atheist, every non-scientist admits that. There's something marvelous about it. And it's only three pounds. And when I heard so many thoughts read in books that there's nothing there, when the brain dies, you're gone, I had to set out and look more carefully at it. What I studied said, no, that's not the case. So it's been a 
good experience teaching, learning from students, learning from other professors. Uh, when I first got my PhD, I worked for a faith ministry, Probe Ministries in Dallas, Texas, where we traveled to state universities around the country, groups of professors um, being invited in uh, very naturally by Christian students and Navigators Campus Crusade to speak on various topics. So I got to teach on this topic in classrooms around the country, uh, sort of in the lion's den, and found an openness to understanding the truth, understanding not from Bible verses necessarily, that's not part of the state university, but from the academic side. This is what I find when I look in my textbook, when I look into brains on the table. You know, it's interesting that uh, periodically we have uh, authors on from Kriegel Academics, and uh, the reason why we have such a great relationship with them is that the uh, spirit-filled approach to things which are of the natural opens up a gateway to the supernatural and uh, there are questions that we have and we have no one to ask these questions to. I shared with you my personal pursuit into the brain uh, upon my father's death and I wanted to know uh, if this loving God that I had come to know, I had come to faith just a few years before my father's passing. And so I was a young believer, believing in the promises of God that all of Israel would be saved, that here my Jewish father, that uh, his family escaped uh, in 1934 from the fall of Hungary to the communists in 1935, that, that this man whose father uh, was a Prussian general and wound up being the Mater D at the German American Club in New York City during World War II, and why they changed the name from Volvich to Walker so that we could assimilate and not be persecuted. And mm -hmm. knowing that, that there was no remnant of Christianity whatsoever, any influence mm -hmm. in his life, our lives, none of that until m me into my mid-40s before I ever heard the gospel. So I, wondering now that I had read the Bible and had been several years in Bible studies, how was God going to meet my father? How was this going to happen? If there was no one to preach, there was no one to teach, how is my loving God going to save this Jewish soul? And so I, I shared with you that I had them tell me what was going on on his EEG, not his EKG when his heart stopped, but what was going on with the EEG, and they noted activity in his brain that continued past the stopping of the heart, that it was not a simultaneous end. And I began a journey into wanting to know if this is where God meets people, if this mm -hmm. is a place of rendezvous, if this is a place where you get this opportunity, what's behind door number one, what's behind mm -hmm. door number two? What is that activity? And we can't ask the dead, we can't probe the dead, we can't extract from the dead, so we believe in the omniscience and the omnipotence and on the omnipresence of God and the faithfulness of God. Could he have met my father in those moments of brain activity? Uh, I think so. Um, the brain does continue longest of any part of the body after death, and that's not continuing for an hour, but for a few minutes. And everybody seems to think that it's so well connected, <clears throat> all parts connected with all parts, down to the subatomic level, perhaps. And it is slowly disconnecting. And I don't know if that is the spirit withdrawing from the matter, but it does hang around for a few minutes. Now, what's happening, we don't know, except it seems fair of our God for a fetus unborn, for a one-year-old child, I could imagine God appearing to your father and saying, are you with me or not? That seems fair for a person who perhaps struggled with all the wrong beliefs, all the lack of knowledge, or just being a youth not having ever asked the question. You know, it's, it's, it's not a justification because I believe that no one comes to the father but through the son. Mm -hmm. But you have to have some method of revelation of that, somebody to tell you about that, 
and mm -hmm. like I said, I, I came to faith at age 44. The first time I heard the gospel in a language I understood, and that was mm -hmm. in a Hebrew setting, in a Jewish setting, in a synagogue that was preaching the gospel. So I was not going to go to a church because that's not who I was. My DNA is Jewish. Right. My parents are Jewish. My grandparents are Jewish. My great-grandparents are Jewish. Sixteen generations that I can go back, all Jewish. So church has no, uh, the cross had no allure. I knew what had been done to me and my people for 2,000 years in the name of Jesus. Now right. now I, I had to come to grips with, now I've been introduced to the Lamb of God. And I understood that from a sacrificial standpoint. Mm -hmm. And could I believe the words of Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptizer, uh, and consider him to be the last Old Testament prophet in order for me to reconcile this? So here I'm coming to grips with death, and right. I go on this long pursuit mm. into the brain. So uh, take <coughs> us into, from a faith perspective, everything you do, I think, is from a biblical worldview. Uh, right. that you find that there is uh, nothing in mm. uh, the science of the brain that refutes the science of the Bible. The, the That's theory. correct. The massive amount of data we collect in neuroscience is correlation data. That is, we look at what the brain is doing and then see what you're thinking or doing with the PET scans or functional MRIs, you're reading a poem, you're thinking something, you're correlating brain activity with what a human being is doing or thinking. That's not cause. And you admit, and I admit, that there is a intensely close relationship between God's spirit and the matter of Adam. And I can't define, I've tried to several times in the book say, in all humility, I can't tell you what that relationship is, how intense it is. It makes sense to me that you're brain activity, when your brain is hurt, when you get hit by a car, is going to affect you. When you go to sleep, it's going to affect you. And yet there are differences that emerge. I think we can demonstrate freedom. I think we can demonstrate by looking at what human persons do. It's fine to have you think of a poem when there's a brain active, brain area active, but then we look at, and I have in the book, every chapter has a person and so the person who is writing the poem, sending the Hubble telescope up, designing the most intricate uh, kinds of films or books, the things we build, libraries, massive buildings, there are tiny little areas of the brain that do that. So look, being willing to look at persons and not just neurons. And that book covers a lot of neurons, a lot of brain areas. And I refuse not to look at the person in order to top down, get some handle on what that brain is doing. Correlations, yes. Perfect correlation, it'll never be. Um, I'm intensely tied to my brain. And you were using the words earlier, uh, soul, body, spirit, mind. And in humility, I'll let you define those. But if, if it's the most complicated structure in the universe, the brain, and then when you start thinking of a soul or spirit, it is far more complicated than we can imagine. When you look at it fairly, it's not coming across as some advanced rabbit brain or chimpanzee brain because you keep a journal, because you fall in love, because you are inspired by courage, heroism, justice. It seems so obvious. Those three pounds are doing much more. What's interesting is, is we go into, in sleep, into a state of pure unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are not cognizant of the world around us, which is what I would define as unconscious. Mm -hmm. Yet, every autonomic system operates in perfect harmony. As a matter of fact, it f is the fulfillment of 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says that anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The person that went to bed last night had different cells than the person that woke up this morning. Mm -hmm. I shed some hair, I grew some hair. I shed some cells, I grew some cells. I burned some, from, some cells uh, in caloric uh, discharge, in keeping that brain fed 
during my unconscious state. And I don't, I can't make my heart beat. I can't make my kidneys cleanse. I can't make my liver function. All of that is there, but so much more. What's so fascinating to me is that in the Hebrew, <clears throat> in the 40,000 Hebrew words that are used many times over again in the Old Testament, there's only 40,000 individual Hebrew words, and not a single one of them is a Hebrew word for brain. Mm -hmm. In the New Testament, there are 11 uh, different words uh, referring to the mind, uh, 11 different Greek words that are simply translated mind, yet each one is slightly different. Uh, mind in, in one of the Greek words is uh, dianoia, um, means willpower or volition. Uh, but yet there's 11 different in the New Testament, different words and references to mind. Uh, and, and it's stunning that in this amazing story of the revelation of creation, of the genealogies, of the descendants, of the Messiah, of the resurrection, of life from the dead, of the timing of things like um, uh, rigor mortis, uh, the Jewish belief of when the soul leaves the body. Uh, all of these things are all intertwined, but they're all centered here. Above, mm -hmm. above the neck, where the, where, the, where the Bible speaks very clearly to the heart, there's concepts and theology and philosophy and psychology that occurs up here. And it's, it's uh, how do you define it? How, how do you um, introduce people to the human brain? Okay. Um. And again, in all humility, if it's the most complicated structure in the universe, physical structure, then we all ought to begin with humility right. and um, like standing on the edge of the ocean and realize there's a massive ocean there. But it seems clear in the last hundred years that you shouldn't look at the brain as a bunch of parts. You shouldn't look at it as a bunch of parts or a bunch of transistors or of elements of a computer everything seems to point to a unity and that's the way the brain operates so when you say it's all up here it really is everything in the brain is doing everything and when we talk about god spots or gay spots it's, it'd be foolish to talk about baseball spots it'd be foolish to talk about philosophy spots yes there's a variety of activities but even the words that are stored that you're speaking now are stored many different places and instantaneously grab what I'm speaking now at about 180 words a minute. How does a little hippocampus in there grab all those? It's a mystery and we see, but we could drift off in error when we start saying, like a computer, there must be 400 parts and this part does this, this part does that. That's not brain science. We do know that your body is a part of feeding that system. So a lot of scientists want to well, let's include the body in that because the head transplants are about to occur in the next six or eight months, which means when you, if you've got a new body and nobody is sure that surgery will work, what's going to be, but we do think this is going to be me, but it's fed by other things. Um, how complicated it is, I started with that, but we know it operates as a unity. It's a oneness to it. Everything does everything and no, your life isn't just a spot, like we're looking for a crime spot, or we you don't even find hunger spots. Of all things, that ought to be simple. No, that's not true. It's, it's a complicated endeavor as you look for you in the brain. So a holistic view, which for me fits a better biblical view of what's going on in those words. It's not a lot of individual things, but there's a wholeness to the person to the living being, to the nephesh. You're talking about a compound unity. Yes. You're talking about a singular plurality that is yes. a concept that is embraced in Scripture in the words Elohim, uh, which is a plural uh, for God, 
but it's a compound unity. It's not a plural meaning multiple. It is a compound unity like a bunch of grapes or a family with a many members or uh, an apartment complex. Uh, one apartment complex, <clears throat> many, many parts. And so this is perfectly aligned with words like echad or yachad in the Hebrew that talk about a compound unity. Hero is where the Lord our God, the Lord is one, but mm -hmm. the word echad is not singular. It is a compound unity. And so that perfectly matches with your description of the brain. It is not divided parts, but it is one operating center, which is a compound unity. Now, uh, a, a friend of mine did uh, uh, worked in the field of facial recognition using uh, dyes to find out where facial recognition and to use it for uh, questioning of terrorists and uh, asking, you know, people, are you a member of a cell? No, 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 no. But if you could have an MRI going on and show them a picture of, do you know who George Washington is? Do you recognize Abraham Lincoln? Do you recognize Osama bin Laden? Oh, all of a sudden, they're, right. you know, oh, I don't know anybody. Do you, do you recognize this guy that we know is a known terrorist? And you can't control the brain chemistry, and so all of a sudden there's a, a, a flow of blood that's being noticed in the MRI that's moving towards a place that, that's like right. bing, 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 bing. Yes, you do recognize it. You say, your words say no, but you're lying, and it bypasses that lie detector that you can beat the box kind of thing, <clears throat> and he's patented this technology uh, for facial recognition using the brain. And so in this case, he was able to isolate, but it was more of a, not a place, but a sphere, uh, a particular area where there was an increased blood flow. Uh, not to say that you can identify other things like hunger spots or those kind of things, but this was a particular area of his research. As we look at, at the question of, uh, and, and you, you talk about this, rivers of the mind shaping the self, I, I want to, before we go to break, sure. leave with that thought of what actually flows. What is a thought? And mm -hmm. how do our thoughts shape us, and can we have, truly have, the mind of God? We're going to explore this and more with Mark Cosgrove, author of The Brain, The Mind, and The Person Within, The Enduring Mystery of the Soul, right after these short announcements. Yes. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television 
talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dr. Mark Cosgrove, author of The Brain, The Mind, and The Person Within, The Enduring Mystery of the Soul. Mark, welcome back to the program. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mark, we've heard the expression left brain, right brain, uh, that the brain seems to have a, uh, an, an area where you could take a scalpel and you could actually separate the hemispheres of the brain. Uh, we've seen some of the, uh, the research and, and stories about lobotomies and prefrontal lobe removals and uh, being able to separate the hemispheres of the brain. Where do we come up with this concept of somebody's right brain, left brain, creative or logical, and those uh, what we would we would assume would be physical centers? Is that actually true? No, it's it's uh, not a good way to look at the brain. If you um, look back to the split brain studies, one thing they did show us was that the left hemisphere, operating by itself, processes the world differently than the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere processes the world um, sequentially, uh, mathematically, one number after another, uh, verbally, one word after another. It's very rational. Right hemisphere, on the other hand, will process the world holistically, emotionally, musically. Um, nobody has more than one of those. That is, they're not more left, more right. Because that corpus callosum in the middle, the hemispheres are connected by 200 million neurons. And everything that happens on one side is immediately sent over to the other side. Everything in the left hemisphere is immediately, in a quarter of a second, sent to the same area on the other side. Everything in the right hemisphere, whatever happens, even though it's being processed differently, is immediately sent to the left side. 
which is what creates imagination. You're mixing left and right hemisphere operations. I see you with both a rational, intuitive, philosophical left hemisphere and a right emotional, linguistic, emotional, musical, feeling-oriented, and then they're mixed, which means we're the only creature on the planet who that we can observe who really runs by imagination. So in a graveyard on Halloween, you think you see a ghost. Now, we do see the world, but it's a world that you make, and hopefully it's close to the world out there. You, when you watch a person on TV, you don't like them, uh, the singer, and yet your daughter loves the person. You see your wife differently than somebody else will see her. Uh, we create the world. Now, some people create a world that is totally wrong, and they think they're Napoleon. But we are an imaginative creature. You live in a world beyond the earth. You, you live in mathematics like Einstein would. Uh, there's a T.S. Eliot poet or a novelist who creates another world. We can see so much in the words of Scripture. We see so much in the plant. Uh, and we see beauty, truth, justice, honor. We, because our two hemispheres mix. Somebody who has a brain split, it's not split all the way through. That is, you still may have some connections in the hippocampus, and they have their whole life that they've lived with the two together. There are problems with splitting a brain, or when a baby is born with a split brain, a genesis, there can be some difficulties in learning two-hand tasks. But there are people who have been born with one hemisphere, just one, and they grew up and both, that hemisphere took both functions, a linguistic, rational, mathematical function and a holistic, artistic um, function and mixes them differently. Um, that is important to us. As human beings, you live beyond the earth and reality. You live in an imaginative world. Hopefully you're not so imaginative that you think the Russians are after you because you are the smartest person on the planet or that you are you might be mentally ill. But we 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 are creating a world because of the enormity of our minds. We live beyond just matter. And that fits in a universe that is so infinite. Our connection to God the concept of God and the relationship with the Messiah mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately to God uh, requires that our brains operate at a certain level of, of uh, embracing the intangible, which grabbing for something that I cannot see but something that I perceive, something that I'm not imagining, but I see it in all reality, and it's not a figmentation of my imagination. It is something that's inherent to the Word of God that is secure and firm. How does my brain know the difference between a fable, a myth, and the inerrancy of Scripture? Um, the brain, when it's doing anything complicated, anything other than picking up a cup of coffee, is processing from many different parts in the brain and creating a whole experience. So if you compare it to a newspaper main office where they're trying to write an article about a sports figure, you have a group of editors who get together and talk about different aspects eventually somebody has to put it together. You process information and you have a brain that's excellent for evaluation. Uh, you don't prove anything right away. You gather evidence for it. In fact, it's very difficult to prove anything in life, but you gather evidence and you say, I think I'm 99% sure that I did brush my teeth this morning. I think I'm 99% sure that this person is who I should marry. There you are at the altar. Uh, who wrote the epistle to Hebrews? Um, I'm 5149 on yeah. Barnabas. Um, we have a brain that's excellent at processing information. It's also excellent at deceiving us. If you don't want to believe something, you just keep processing what you want to hear, and you don't look at anything else. Uh, again, a humble person should look at all sides of an issue, and you do. And we come to a conclusion that is 
certain percentage. And for Christian witnessing purposes, I feel strongly about the things that I believe when I talk to another person. Again, who wrote the epistle to Hebrews? I may not know, but has God changed my life over time? As I look at fellow believers, as I look at the, the things that I have lived one way, I look at the past and say, how did I kid myself? How did I deceive myself? I'm looking over time, evaluating information over time. And Christian theism does very well. I had a book called, um, for Kriegel, called The uh, Foundations of Christian Thought, just looking at worldviews of different, uh, different on our planet. So humanistic thought, secular humanism, uh, naturalism, pantheism, and run through tests of a worldview. And Christian theism does excellently in terms of how would you test a worldview. It's firmly grounded in what we human beings think of as test and truth. When we look at <clears throat> the concept of soul, nefesh, uh, in the Hebrew, what part does the brain play in this complex mystery? And when we go to, and, and it's, it's, it's so interesting because I have this conversation often. The Bible tells us where our spirit goes. Mm -hmm. Bible tells us where our body goes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that I recall uh, any specific passage of Scripture that tells me where my soul goes. But yet we forensically would argue that we are created in the image of God. Uh, mm -hmm. Forensically, God is two parts invisible, one part visible. We mm -hmm. then naturally would be two parts invisible, one part visible. All right, if we were forensically created in the image, not just the internal, but the external image of God. Well, you can't see my soul, you can't see my spirit, but you can see my flesh. No one can look upon the Father, no one can see the Spirit of God, but we can see the Son. So forensically, I can argue two parts invisible, one part visible, we match the Godhead in this. But I know my spirit goes on to be with the Lord, my body mm -hmm. goes into decay into the ground, but where does my soul go, and what exactly does that mean? <laughs> Remember, you're talking to a scientist. Yes, and that's, I, that's what I'm I want. An amateur, amateur theologian, which am, ammo is the Latin word for love, so I love theology. Um, we groan for the redemption of our bodies. I think there is an unnatural state uh, waiting for to put those together again. Now, what does God do? Provide a temporary integration point for us and our being? I, I don't know. Uh, some say that time is so short for God on his side of eternity, it's just a second. So when we enter heaven, it'll be sa almost the same time Paul is entering heaven. Others say, no, he's got his hand on us. He is the integration point, and our minds are just clouded, not there, like when we go to sleep. Uh, again, that's an amateur neuroscientist. I'll let you answer <laughs> that well, hard a question. You know, that's, that's, uh, in some cases, I have more questions than I have answers, and that's one of the beautiful <laughs> myst mysteries of the Bible and the mysteries of the mind is that... Uh, as we age, you know, you and I are not as young as we used to be. No. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and our minds, uh, for a number of reasons, environmental, uh, food sources, uh, our minds are now being attacked uh, at a level either our diagnostic capabilities have advanced to the point where we can now name Alzheimer's or uh, dementia or those kind of things, or there's been a physiological change environmentally impacting our brains. Mm -hmm. uh, what's happening in that particular area that we've now become more aware of uh, these kind of brain uh, conditions? Right. If you, um, if you look at the current research today, it's a lot less worrisome as people age, now Alzheimer's is a different matter. The brain is being destroyed. If you think about aging, people used to think that, well, you're losing neurons, you're losing brain cells, and that's too bad. Except 
we know now that it's not the loss of neurons that is troublesome to you. Um, you right now can think better than you at 16, you at 25. Uh, there's a part of you that continues to grow, even though there are neurons that are fading away occasionally. We also know that every night you go to sleep, your cortex, that gray matter on the outside, shrinks by 20%. Now, an aged person has a cortex that's 20% shrunken, and, and I just said that doesn't matter as much. It, yours shrinks at night because the connections are dissembled, and those that are less important are replaced by something you learn during the day, and it forms again in the morning. You're constantly having an unassembling and a reassembling again. The elderly person, perhaps those memories the kind of things that come with sleep when you have sleep difficulties. It's not quite as good. I don't remember what I did last weekend or what movie I saw. Fine. But thinking, that part of your being um, goes on well. You can write the best book of your life. Now, again, if you have Alzheimer's, no. But aging seems to be much more of a positive state than people were telling us before. Now, when you're 120... Um, no, we're not going to be able to hang around and do all kinds of things. Um, yeah, the physical brain is not doing as well, uh, particularly in memory, but gosh, there's so much to us that's not memory. I tell my students when I can't remember a proper noun, say, somebody whose computer's out, would you Google that? And they come up with it right away. That's not me. And when we talk about, I want to put you into a computer so you can be eternal. We only talk about memory. Let's take all your memory circuits, your NMDA receptors, put them into a computer, and then you can continue to live forever. No, you could take my book and put it in a computer, and that's not me, uh, nor is memory you. The person of Ronald Reagan, the person who's got Alzheimer's and is standing blankly there. Yeah, there's something different. That's like being dead, but when I can't remember a proper noun, when you can't, when it becomes harder to think at age 100, fine. But there's a part to us that is separate and maintains a strength. Wilder Penfield years ago in studying, he wrote a book called The Mystery of the Mind after he studied people who were undergoing brain surgery awake during epilepsy. And he found that they would go through a process of sleep and he looked at when they were sleeping and he decided that all that's happening is that somehow the mind needs the energy of the brain. That is, it's still there. And somehow the brain has to provide energy. And when you wake up, it's not like you were sleeping and sitting there waiting for your body to wake up. There's a partnership that demands the brain has to give the mind something. And he suggested energy. We have to keep our brains healthy. We have to keep exploring and studying and somebody who doesn't go to school, doesn't care, just wants to hit and eat, uh, they're not going to do well either in thinking. So when you're 110, when I'm 110, yes, we're going to do just fine. Um, let Google fill in some of the blanks. You know, it's interesting you said that. My mother will be 92 at okay. <laughs> the end of July. And her new statement now, her response is, if she can't remember something, she says, do you need to know that right away? <laughs> Yeah. Right? Because Excellent. because at three thirty in the morning, I'm going to think exactly of that. I'll have your answer ready for you, but I won't call you. I'll text you in the morning. Uh, yes. But is that something you need to know right away? Because because <laughs> if so, you need another source. If uh, you do, get on Google and find it. <laughs> exactly. And she's pretty savvy with her phone. She sends me emojis yeah. and and uh, text messages all the time and FaceTimes and and. Uh, she plays golf uh, ah, s still fine. still to this day, um, and uh, she, she'll she go kicking and screaming into oh. the end of her days. Uh, Good I for can, her. I can assure you that. So uh, we, we now have this other area that I want to introduce, and that is um, personality mm. and demonic influences uh, the principalities, the darkness, the uh, mm -hmm. is it mental illness, is it spiritual attack? Is there a way to distinguish 
between the two scientifically? Or is this all in the area of um, biblical or theological uh, co conquest or pursuit? I wonder if, like most things, you're going to get an answer that is sometimes, not most of the time, or whatever. There certainly is progress being made in mental illness and mental health in some of the things we use, like pills, like Prozac for depression or something. Um, it always remains true that whatever we're taking, talking therapy along with it is better than just a pill alone or deep brain stimulation or whatever. So having that human element touch our minds, convince us of we can do better and so on. So there is something human going on, touching our brains, touching those cells, as well as the pills that can help. I would not change what I'm taking for diabetes or some other heart problem. Uh, adding the human element to people increases their life, increases their joy, and so on. Now, with that said, I don't see any reason why Satan cannot do the same thing either through the books we read, the people we come in contact with, our own free thoughts. Your thinking does change your performance in a marathon. If you're not thinking positively, you're going to give out. I mean, that, that, that athletic view of things. Um, can Satan be possessing us, in us, in ways that we resist and don't want? The United States is not a good country to ask that in sure. because it, apparently you have to believe in him to open up the door, but to go to Haiti or other countries, you see much more of it. And I'm not an expert in that, except I think that's possible. <clears throat> Some people say in multiple personalities might be the best example of it, that these may not be just cases of abuse, which certainly correlate with it, physical, mental abuse. Um, but the brain is capable of splitting its personalities under severe circumstances. Can Satan enter into that? Yes, I suspect he has a lot more effort and activity in TV commercials, in ordinary things that we see, in pushing our habits along rather than I need to be in you, except maybe at the moment of a strange death of somebody very good, a believer who fell at the last minute. I believe that's possible. Uh, certainly we know the signs of of a demon being exercised, and that's you don't do that with most mental illness. So if you wanted to find out if that psychotic in Haiti was demon-possessed or not, just use the Lord's name. Say, I cast you out. A mentally ill person in a hospital, most of the time, that's not the case. And again, in America, we don't see it as much as in other parts of the world where there's more of a belief in the demonic world. You know, Our secularism <clears throat> helps us. I don't... No, I, 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 I think that you've explained that extremely well. As we look at the future of technology and mm -hmm. uh, trying to replicate, uh, there is technology going on for artificial pancreas. There's technology going on for kidney assistance in, in the um, artificial. Uh, we, we remember Dr. DeBakey and the artif first artificial heart. Mm -hmm. um, in the area of, of uh, the brain, mm -hmm. as we're looking at uh, cloning, we're looking at stem cell, we're looking at uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of, of different technologies, uh, the implanting of chips, not just for RFID, uh, which is, the, in my opinion, the conspiracy theory of the mark of the beast, because uh, I read it differently than it being uh, it's something that would be noticeable and visible. I can't see I can't see your chip, but I can see right. what's on your forehead. Um, right. Where is technology taking us, and are we using it as an excuse not to be thinkers like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, mm -hmm. and what? we would consider to be the thinkers, uh, mm -hmm. the model of thinkers of the past, the Copernicuses, the, the paradigm breakers, the paradigm shifters, the Galileos of old. Uh, are, is that passe now? Is that something that technology is 
flown far past, and now we've used artificial intelligence as opposed to God-given intelligence? Um, good question, and let me say that technology is changing so fast that anything I say right now, so brain chips that will re change thinking, we do get enabled by some of the changes we're making, but are we just trying to reframe a new man? Are we taking creation in our own hands? If I can say it, it already exists now. So when Mark Zuckerberg says brain chips will allow you to type 100 words a minute by thinking it, open the garage door by flexing your shoulder, change your TV channels. It's already being done in the military. It's already being done if it makes a profit. Uh, there are enormous things that are coming in the next five years, and half of them are already there. And that's the scary part, because the ethics we're barely thinking about, the, the robots. Uh, Japan and Malaysia have to develop robots because of a shrinking population. So we're, it's not just going to be mowing your lawn, driving your car, and we have to think, what are we going to do when our jobs are gone? Or developing the brain nets to where you and I could think together, just like we do on the Internet, and that's possible. You could download dreams or dream starters, 15 seconds of a dream with an EEG paired with a magnetic stimulator, put my non-anxious brain waves in your brain, we'll have to see if it works, my dream starter in your brain, the right spot, just start the waves with a magnetic stimulator. All that is here now. You see the brief experiments on it, the help that it gives to a quadriplegic. Uh, it's going, if it'll sell, it's going to be in our hands, in our phone, except Mark says we're not gonna have a phone, it'll be in your head. Um, that is coming so fast. If you can think it, it's already here, it's in the lab, if it'll make a profit. And then the next five years, more things. It's coming faster. So we need our students to be trained in ethics as well as in the science because it's not going to be us that determines whether it's right or wrong. It's going to be profit. It's going to be, um, you know, brain chips. We need brain chips that we can spray on you. You can now inject brain chips that will spread out over the brain that are two-way, both send and receive, which means they'll connect to the internet. You could listen to your rock singer, nothing wrong with rock music, it could be Miley Cyrus in France, and you've got a computer 12,000 miles away, and you have, she's got a small EEG strap, and you have a magnetic stimulator, you can feel the emotion <clears throat> of the song, you can in a movie, you'll be smelling, you'll be thinking, that changes your, your thoughts. We need to think of the ethics, not for my children, but for <clears throat> children and grandchildren in the next five, six, seven years, not 40 years. Right. So, so there's so many things coming. Yes, we need ethics. We need to think about, are we, are we changing? Let's not be Little House on the Prairie forever. Let's have jet planes, Let's and we need to think what will make it good. How can we best help people become yeah. better as people? That's, that's the bottom, <clears throat> bottom line for us as human beings, the bottom line for us as believers, is yes. can we be more transformed into the image of the Messiah? Right, We've been talking right. with Mark Cosgrove, author of The Brain, The Mind, and The Person Within, the Enduring Mystery of the Soul. Mark Cosgrove, thank you so much for your time spent with us here today on Revealing Appreciate the Truth. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. God bless you, too. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.